so father i thank you that um i thank you again for this way of connecting i thank you that um you have set this desire in each one of us to know you but through your word and i pray lord god that you would help us to understand uh, what it is that we look at and what what we're hearing you say to us lord uh, I, I, I know that you say so many times in your word that you you will guide us, you will lead us, you will direct our path. And Father, that's what we want. We want to be directed and guided and led, Lord. Uh, just because we know that you are the God of all the earth, you are the great creator and sustainer of all things. Your knowledge is infinite, your wisdom is infinite, your, you know beyond knowing, Lord, and, and us in our finite human bodies with our tiny human minds, Lord, we are so grateful that you would speak to us and give us understanding and wisdom as we ask you for it. So, as James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to each one impartially. So, Lord, we ask you for wisdom right now. I ask you for wisdom, Lord. I ask you to help me to take the knowledge of your word and to live according to it, Lord, to act according to it in a way that brings you glory and honour. And um, I, I praise you, Lord, that, that as I do that, you will give me great joy. So I pray that for everyone here, Lord, and everyone who might hear this video um, online. Lord God, that you would be glorified and that we would know that great joy of our salvation. And I thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we finished the last session by uh, touching on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 7, where Paul is explaining to the Corinthians how they would do what God had called them to do, um, how, how God was actually using Paul. Um, so if you, if you can, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, and we'll just read 4 to 7. Now there are a varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Um, Paul, in this chapter, as you probably know, you've probably read it, is um, going to explain how the church works, how the body of Christ works. And, um, and he's doing that because just before, at the end of chapter 10, he told them that they were to do everything to the glory of God. Look at what he says in um, chapter 10, verse 30. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offence either to Jews or to Greeks to, or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as also I am of Christ. So here is this um, do all for the glory of God. And, you know, as they heard that, as they read this, as this scroll was read to them of what uh, Paul is sending to them, they must have thought, how, <laughs> how do I do everything for the glory of God? Because, you know, isn't that the question we would ask? Well, how, how do I live for the glory of God? How do I do things that will honour God? Um, and, th and the reason we have the word of God is because if we didn't have the word of God, we would be coming up with ways to honour God and to do everything for the glory of God. And they would be, sorry to say, hope, hope no one's insulted, but they would be a long way from the things that actually glorify God, because we would come at it from our finite human thinking and we would just tend to tweak our morality a little bit the ethics that we grew up with and we would offer that to God thinking that that was the way that we would honour him and glorify him and Paul wants to set us straight imitate me as I imitate Christ do all things for the glory of God you know the church in our day it loves to sing songs about us about me I was reminded just the other day as I was preparing this about a song that, you know it's a great song and I've heard it played in many churches if I've been to different ones and to speak in different ones it's very often a, a song that the congregation is singing and it's the song that is um 
you know, that when Christ was on the cross, he thought of me above all, above all nations, above all things. I can't remember all the words, above all wisdom, above all treasures, above all everything. Christ thought of me above all. But that's not true. When Christ was on the cross, he didn't think of me. He didn't think of you. He thought of the glory of God. He thought of his father. And it is so important in our day particularly that we understand that because um, we have been called to live for the glory of God, to imitate Christ. So if we are starting to believe that Christ thought about us above all else, that his important focus was on each one of us, then we will shift our focus from God to us. We will shift our focus from the glory of God to the glory of man. We will be thinking about man and, and aiming all of our work and all of our ministry towards mankind. And that has caused the downfall of the church. That has called, caused great problems within the church. So, um, I just wanted to briefly, before we get into actually the, the main part of this session, look at John chapter 17. You know, I'm saying that Jesus thought about God above all else, not uh, he didn't think about us above all. Of course, he died for the world. I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him would um would not perish but have eternal life of course that was the purpose for which he came because the love of god sent the son of god to die for us of course but as christ was on the cross and as he was walking this planet his main thought was not for the glory of the people who would believe in him it was for the glory of the father who sent him for the great god of all the earth and in john 17 when he begins to pray for um, uh, for the people who were with him for his disciples and for those he says who would believe in him through their word look at what he says in, in verse 1 Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven he said father the hour has come glorify your son why that the father that the son may glorify you Christ did everything for the glory of God. And when you read, imitate Christ, imitate me, Paul says, as I imitate Christ, you know that Paul set his life to for the glory of Christ Jesus. The purpose of his life was to proclaim the glory of Christ Jesus, to proclaim the glory of God. So when we talk about living on purpose, we have to understand this that the purpose of our life is the glory of God. You know, look at what Jesus says there. The hour has come, glorify me that I might glorify you. The cross of Jesus Christ was the instrument of glory. The death of Jesus was the means and the revelation of that glory. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the proclamation of that glory. Everything about the cross is proclaiming the glory of God. It is proclaiming the glory of God. Yes, Christ took your sins, my sins, the sins of the whole world. He took all of those sins upon himself and he paid. He is the propitiation. Romans will tell us that he is the propitiation. He is the necessary, required, acceptable service, uh, sacrifice for our sins. He did that for your sin and my sin from the beginning of time till the end of time. He paid the price and whosoever believes believes in him shall have life in his name. We will be given his righteousness because he has taken our sin. Second Corinthians chapter five. He made him who knew no sin, verse 21, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But he did that for the glory of God, for the glory of God. It's important because this course is called Living on Purpose, and your life has purpose. It has meaning, but it, its purpose is found in the glory of God. Your purpose is found in God's 
glory. Your gifting, your ministry, the results of your gifting and ministry, which is uh, we talked about in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 7, all proclaim the magnificence of God. It is about God. It is all about him. It is all about Jesus. It is all for him and all about him. Colossians 1, 16. Look at Colossians. Flip over in, in your Bible, just Colossians 1, verse 16. This fantastic section where Paul is, is uh, you know, just explaining who Christ is. He's just called uh, the, the Co Colossians believers. He's told them, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that, look at what he says in verse 9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, your love and the spirit for all the saints, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And then in verse 16, I mean, we can't read all that, that passage. I'd love to because it's fantastic. But um, look at what he says in verse um, 16. For by him, Christ all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All things in heaven and on earth in our entire universe, all things were, be, were created by him and through him and for him. You and I were created for God, for Jesus. We were created for him. We were created by him and through him and for him. And everything we do now, living the life that he has given us because we have believed in his sacrifice on our behalf, everything we do now is an explosion of praise for him, for him. It is not about you and about me. This life is not about us. It is about Jesus. It is about proclaiming the excellence of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It is about the Lord. And as we understand that, as you understand that everything is about the glory of God, the glory of Christ Jesus, you take the first step as it were, of living the life of purpose. You take that first step, and as you take it, the wonder of it, the glory of it in part, is that it sets us free. It sets us free. Until you understand, until we understand that this life is all about God, that it's all for his glory, that it's all for his purpose, until we understand that, we are bound up in stuff about us. It's all about us. It's about our happiness or unhappiness. It's about our wealth or our poverty. It's about our health or our sickness. It's about how I feel and rather than being about who God is. As soon as you and I understand that this life, the purpose of it, the meaning of it is found in God, in the glory of God, as soon as we do, we are set free. We are set free. And that is the blessing of the glory of God. That's how he blesses us as we choose to live on purpose for him. We understand that I'm free. I'm free. In John chapter um, 20, uh, John will write many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, but these have been uh, written that you might have life, that you might believe, sorry, that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life in his name. What is life? in his name. Life, the life that Christ gives us, the life that God has given us in Christ Jesus is a life of perfect freedom. 
We are free from fear. We are free from all of the things that chained us down. We are free, free to walk and to talk and to proclaim God and to know that as we do it, our life has purpose and meaning. Our life is used for his glory. Our life is going to be a proclamation in the heavenly places of the greatness and the wonder and the grace of God. We have been given real life. We didn't know what that was before we came to Christ. We thought we had it. We thought we had life. But when we came to Christ Jesus, he opened the door. He opened the door to the glory of God. And as we step in, as we step in, we understand that the glory of God is the best thing, the very best thing about our new life in Christ Jesus. Um, we live on this planet in the stage of our sanctification you know um, we were justified by christ at the moment that we believed we were justified we were reconciled with god we were called righteous at that moment and one day when we go to be with him we will be glorified we will have physical new bodies we will be totally and utterly glorious for eternity but we are living now you and i you're watching this video i'm speaking into the camera we are living in the time of our sanctification and that time jesus told us is going to be a time of difficulty, a time of trouble, a time of sorrow often, and a time of pain. This is the time when we are being prepared to be with him in glory. John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, in this world, in this time of sanctification, you will have trouble, but take courage, I have overcome the world. There is a way to go through the difficulty and the trial and the pain and the suffering and the sorrow. There is a way to walk through that, to walk through that in peace and with joy. There is a way to live for the glory of God in this time of trouble. And um, through the writer to the Hebrews, God will tell us the way. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Um, uh, let's just go there. Hebrews 12, verse one and two. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy set before him? The glory of God. What was the joy set before Christ? What was the thing he fixed his eyes on? The glory of God. The glory of God that would be revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ. The glory of God that would be revealed in heavenly places and on the earth. The glory of the majestic, holy, righteous, loving, faithful God that would be revealed in Jesus Christ, fixing our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of faith, run the race set before you. And Paul had done that. Paul had run the race. You know, when he writes to Timothy, the last letter that Paul wrote in chapter four, verses six to eight, he says, I have finished the course. I have run the race. Let's um, look at it. Second Timothy chapter four. Um, Second Timothy four verse six to eight, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, Paul can write, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because he knows he's running the race set before him. If he wrote Hebrews, and nobody really knows who wrote Hebrews, um, he can write that. He can say, fix your eyes on Jesus, because that's what he's doing. He can say all of the things he says in his letters, not because he has reached perfection, but because through the troubles of this life, he understands that Christ has 
overcome and that he will enable him to overcome and to live for the glory of God. And that's what we have to understand as we think about imitating uh, Paul as he imitates Christ, as we think about living on purpose. What does that look like? You know, Paul will write in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he'll say, For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, let me go to it in case I told you, in case I um, uh, don't, don't state it carefully enough. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up to me. That word, I live by faith in the Son of God, that phrase can also be translated, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. So, but his statement, even at the beginning, whichever way you translate it, I have been crucified with Christ. I have died in Christ. It's the corroboration of what he wrote in Romans, that if you've believed in Christ, you've been, you died with him, you've been buried with him, you've been raised to walk with him in newness of life. So, but here he says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. And in a way that we can't totally understand, he then follows that with, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The dual aspect of Christ living in me and me trusting that he is living in me and living by faith in that Son of God. Only Christ Jesus. I've said this so many times before in all, my, in, in all the different things. Only Christ can live the Christian life. I can't live the Christian life successfully. I cannot live it successfully on my own. I have to let Christ live the life in me. I have to trust that his spirit who dwells within me has promised to live the life that glorifies God in and through me. And as I trust, I align myself with what I hear from God through the spirit. I align myself with what I read and I choose I choose to do what I read, to do what I hear the Spirit telling me to do. I choose to live on purpose for God, for Christ Jesus. And I believe that he will enable me to do it. That is the Christian life. That is a life lived on purpose. And, um, and he has promised, Christ Jesus has promised that he will do it. You know, you remember in um, Second Chronicles, I think, in uh, verse uh, chapter 12, where Paul uh, explains that he's had a thorn in the flesh and he's, he's, begged, he's begged God three times to remove that thorn in the flesh. And God's answer has always been, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. This is the truth of the Christian life. You know, no, no, I will live in power through you and my power will be manifested and made evident through your weakness, through your weakness. That is what it is, is Christ at work in me. It is Christ living in and through me in power manifested and made evident and proclaimed through my weakness, through my inability. So, um, yeah, uh, Christ is going to live the life of purpose for you. He's going to ask you to choose to live that life. Last week we talked about um, uh, some things that I had seen about living a life of purpose and uh, the fact that we had to choose. We had to choose to live by what we believed. We had to set priorities. We had to um, do various things. I can't remember the list now, but uh, if you didn't see the first session, go back and watch it on, um, on YouTube. But here now, um, I wanted to talk about 
what the finish line will look like. And I know that's a bit strange because there's a lot of stuff that's got to come in between. But uh, first session was about choosing to live that life of purpose. What is a life of purpose? And, and I must choose it. But also now I want to talk about before we go on into the nuts and bolts, as it were, of what we do in that life of purpose is to really think about what it will look like if I've run well. What will my life look like if I have run well? When I'm um, reaching the end, what will it look like? And I, and I think it's important because I think we can have a lot of misconceptions about this Christian life and about what I'm supposed to be doing and, and thinking and feeling. And so um, I want us to run with confidence. You know, Paul ran with confidence. He ran the race. He finished the course. He said the time for his departure was upon him. He knew that he was any any day now he was going to go and face his saviour. And he was not afraid because he knew he had finished the course. He had run the race. And I want us to know that too. I want us to be able to be sure in so far as we are able to see that or to believe that we are doing what we have been called to do and that when we see our saviour we are going to hear him say well done so um what does it mean to finish the course then what does it mean to fight the good fight what does it mean what will it look like when i reach the end and um i think first it's important to remember the first thing is that we won't always feel like we're running well <laughs> You know, we won't always feel like we are finishing well. Um, I think we might get to the finish line with some scars, physical, emotional scars, mental scars um, from the fight. I think we might need a helping hand down the home straight, as it were. Um, I think we might um, we might need um, help from other believers around us i think that there might be many 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 times when we want to stop but we just keep keeping on and the thing that i want to focus on the most in this session is what when we finish if we've fallen if we've paused if we have failed if we've got bruised if we reach the end battered battered from the race and the fight. The only question that will be important is, how is your heart towards God? How is your heart towards God? The innermost you. How is the innermost you towards God? So, um, you know, that's really what this session is gonna be about because the overriding uh, instruction in scripture is that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength and mind. That is the over from Genesis to Revelation, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. That is the number one thought um, instruction in, in the scriptures. So um, loving him, continuing to love him, working out that love living that love is what will take us to the finish line and so i want to have a look at um, some thoughts about finishing well and the first thing is we will know that we are finishing well because we have kept the faith that's the first thing you have kept the faith and i want to be sure that we understand what that is because we are called living on purpose i said last time was to live according to our beliefs to live according to our beliefs but you know we can take some wrong turns living according to our beliefs because our beliefs are not necessarily always the faith there is the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints jude will say contend earnestly verse 3 of jude for the faith for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints and he'll tell them why in his letter because a certain people have crept in unnoticed crept into the church unnoticed and they are distorting the truth 
and they are turning the grace of God into licentiousness and they are doing all manner of things. And Jude says the important thing for us, for believers, is to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. So finishing well, knowing that you're finishing well, knowing that you are, uh, that you are, you have stayed the course, you have run the race, you have fought the fight, is that you have kept the faith. You haven't turned around. You haven't turned back in the middle of the race. You know, you've heard people at the side of you, people off, off the track, in the crowd, as it were, they've been calling, you're running the wrong way. Oh my goodness, you're not running right. You're on the wrong road. You better turn around, you better come off. This is too hard anyway, it's too difficult. This can't be the road to Jesus. I mean, for goodness sake, he thought of you above all. He wants to make your life easy and, and, and happy and, and give you everything that you want this can't be the race isn't it difficult isn't it too hard um yeah so you have not stepped off the track you have kept running you have kept the faith you have have uh not listened to um the words of people on the side of your track you have kept your belief your faith as and your trust in the Lord Jesus as he is described and proclaimed in scripture. You have not allowed people to tell you about Jesus, something that you cannot confirm in the word. You have aligned your thinking about Jesus with what you know to be true in the word of God and in that way you have kept the faith. So you are uh, finishing well because even though there's much opposition, and even though you've had to go over mountains and down in valleys and you've heard loud voices and they've cried out to you all sorts of things to tell you you're doing the wrong thing and you're going the wrong way, you have continued to put your trust in the Lord Jesus as he is proclaimed in the word of God. You are finishing well. What about a number two? Number two, how do you know you're finishing well? How do you know you're running the race? You have guarded your heart. You have guarded your heart. You set your priorities. Remember last week, setting priorities. First one was a life lived on purpose is a life lived according to your belief. And now, and the second one was someone who lives on purpose sets their priorities. So you have set your priorities and your priority is to keep your heart soft towards God, to keep your heart soft. God wants you to know him better and you want to make him to know him better and to make him known. You have continually asked God to help you in that area. And when something difficult has come, when the thorns and the thistles have come in your life, when the troubles and the difficulties have made things difficult and painful and sorrowful for you, you have not blamed God. You have turned to God and asked for his help to navigate through those bitter and difficult times. And, but you have held on, you have set your priority. Your priority is to maintain a soft heart towards the Lord your God. And you are thankful for what he's done. Remember what uh, one of the things last week I uh, quoted, I think it's, um, it was Annie Dillard, I can't remember if it was her quote or not. Um, don't, um, don't uh, cry because it's over. Be happy because it happened. Find your joy in the Lord. Don't cry about things that have um, tripped you up, caused you pain, caused you sorrow. Thank the Lord that he has taken you through it. Thank you that you have come out into a, uh, thank him that you have come out into a brand new bright day. So um, finish, uh, if you're finishing well, you will keep the faith. If you are finishing well, you will guard your heart. Guard your heart. 
spend your time in the word of God, remind yourself about who your God is, remind yourself of his great glory and his amazing purpose and the race that he has set before you. Remind yourself of the way that he has promised that he will see you through, that his grace will be sufficient for you, even in those times when you are feeling the thorns and the thistles of this life. Take courage, Jesus said. In this world, you will have difficulty, but I have overcome. Remember those promises and hold them close to you. And in that way, guard your heart. If you're finishing well, what, what will you find? Number three, that you have kept your focus. You have kept your focus. You have kept the faith. You have guarded your heart and you have kept your focus on Jesus. You have fixed your eyes on him. You have fixed your eyes on him, the author and finisher of your faith. Paul will write to the Colossians in chapter four, verse one, he'll say, if you have been raised up with him, keep seeking things above, keep seeking the heavenly things. That's focusing on Jesus. That's seeking after Jesus. That's fixing your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Don't let the lights and the attractions of this world take your eyes off and put them down here. Don't, don't let your eyes fall to the things of this world in whichever way, bad or good, because they will take your focus from Jesus. Make Jesus your purpose, your reason. Hit the proclamation of his glory, your, your proclamation. Make him your focus, your central reason to be, and you will finish well. You will finish well. Keep the faith according to the, the truth that is written in the word. Set your priority to be guarding your heart, to keep your heart free from entanglement in this world and um, keep your focus on Jesus. You see, um, uh, well, I'll finish, I'll finish the next two first before. Number four, how will you finish well? How will you run the race? How will you finish the race? You are pressing on. You will keep pressing on. You will still say to the Lord, Father, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? In the, in, in, in the way Paul says it, you will forget what lies behind and press on towards what lies ahead. You will lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of you. You will keep pressing on. Or as last time I think I said about Caleb, I did say about Caleb, he was 85 years old. And he was still asking the Lord for the land. Lord, I'm still as strong and as able as I was 40 years ago, 45 years ago when we were in the wilderness. And I have come into this land and I have taken some of this land, but I want more. I want more. Keep pressing on. Keep persevering. Keep going in the race. Keep moving. Keep moving forward. That is finishing well. And number five, as you are running, as you are keeping the faith, as you are guarding your heart, as you have keep, kept your focus on Jesus, as you are pressing on, as you are doing those things, eagerly desire his return. Eagerly desire his return. Didn't Paul say he would receive a crown of righteousness because he was eagerly desiring his departure and and god would give that crown to everyone who eagerly anticipated the return of jesus um, you are the way that you finish well the way that you keep going the way that you run the race is that you are mindful that christ is coming back that he is coming soon and not only are you mindful you are looking forward to that arrival. You are looking forward to seeing your saviour. You are hoping and longing for that to happen. And that takes prayer. You know, you have family, don't you? You have family, you have children, you have grandchildren, or, or you have 
you know, friends that you love and, and that you, you want to come to the Lord Jesus and you still want to be there to talk to them about uh, the Lord and to give them the gospel. And that's important. Of course, it's important. But the main focus, remember, is always Jesus. Always Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep focusing on him. He's coming back long for his appearing long for his appearing as you eagerly wait as you eagerly anticipate as you eagerly desire his return what you're saying is i'm trusting you for all those people you've put in my life i'm trusting you for all of those people you've had me pray for and speak to and for all of those situations that you've taken me into that are unfinished as far as i can see with my human eyes i'm trusting you I'm trusting you for them. And I'm saying, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come quickly. For I long to see you. I long for your appearing. That is finishing well. That's finishing well. You know, those five things are what we need to be thinking about as we are running our race, as we are fighting the fight, as we are attempting to finish the course. So that we can say, as Paul said, the time of my departure has come and I have finished my course. I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. Paul uses in 2 Timothy that word departing. And it's a really interesting word because it's only used there in, in the entire Bible, that, that particular word for departing. And it has uh, various kind of uses in, in the Greek language. And it means actually unloosed. It means untied. And it, it, it was used in different ways. It was used for... Uh, taking up the ropes that fix the tent you know when you set you went camping and you set a tent and uh, you bang the pegs in and and fix the is it the guy ropes or whatever they are and I don't like camping so um, I don't know the terms but the uh, the use of it is when the pegs were lifted up and the tent was folded down and you were ready to go it was that that idea of unloosing the tent pegs it was used in farming when they uh, yoked oxen together or animals together. And it was the idea of unyoking at the end of the day, when, you came, when the animals came to the end of the day and you took them back into the stable or wherever they, they slept for the night and you unyoked them, you unyoked them. And it was used for uh, shipping, maybe the most often it was used in shipping, where a ship would be, anchor would be lifted up and it would be ready to sail. Now, can you see? Can you see why Paul would use that particular word for departure as he was writing to Timothy? Look at what he's saying. The time for me to be fixed to this earth is over. The tent pegs are going to be lifted and I'm going to be going where I belong. The oxen, I'm not going to be yoked to this world anymore. My feet have had to walk through the mud and the clay and the mire and the difficulty, but they're going to be lifted up and I'm going to be unyoked from this world. And then the ship, the ship that I've been sailing in or that I have been anchored in, is the anchor is going to be lifted and I am going to set sail into my eternity and it's going to be glorious. Paul used that example. And he used it even though his life, his life was full of adventure and, and uh, things happening. And, and it had been a terrific life. And he knew that he had had a purpose. We looked at last time in Acts chapter 20. He had received his ministry from the Lord Jesus. And he knew that he had that ministry. And, it, and he had willingly taken on that ministry and he lived his life for the glory of God and he wrote those letters that we now live and breathe through that, that God had used him to write those letters um, but and he's now in prison awaiting certain death but he can write the time of my departure is here and I'm ready I'm ready to go I can look back at my race and I can know that I finished the course. I finished the course and I ran well. How do you want to know that you finished well? Those things that I've said, 
it's not about what you do. It's about your relationship with God. It's about keeping the faith, the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. It's about choosing to align your thinking with the faith, not just because you believe a certain thing, but because God has told you a certain thing in his word and the spirit of God has really confirmed that in you as you have understood it. It's about um, setting your priorities. It's about, what did I say? Um, sorry, I want to make sure. You guarded your heart. That's been the priority in your life. You have not allowed your heart to get hardened to God because of difficulty or trouble. You have understood that God is at work through the difficulty and the trouble in your life and that he is changing you and molding you and shaping you into the image of Jesus. And he is making you ready for the end and beyond into the new life the fullness of life that he has got for you. It's about you guarding your heart, deliberately guarding your heart. It's about you keeping your focus on Jesus, setting your eyes on Jesus, following him, imitating those who imitated him. It's about you choosing to do that. And it's about you pressing on, no matter the difficulty, no matter how hard it seems, no matter how hard the race becomes, it's about you pressing on. And that doesn't mean that you're able to run Run fast through every difficulty. It means that sometimes you just have to speak to yourself in the morning, get up and take another step. Press on, press on to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has already laid hold of you. And it is about eagerly desiring his return. It's about longing for Jesus, longing for him, to know him, to see him, to know as you have been known. To know him and to, to long to live with him, by his side, with him for eternity. No matter how difficult the race is, the finishing line is what we're looking at. The finishing line. And I want to get there. And I, I know that you do too, or many of you who are watching this. I know that you want to get there, having lived on purpose, having lived the life that God has called you to live. And I know that the only way to do that is to choose to do the things that God has called us to do. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul, I talked about it last time, Paul uh, talks about the way that we can um, that um, that we can look at the Old Testament examples that God that those things are written down for our instruction. And um, uh, and last time I, I talked about Caleb and Nehemiah, we looked at those things. And I want to take a look at uh, some more from uh, this in this session. So could you go to Joshua, Joshua chapter three, Joshua, a contemporary, of course, of Caleb, um, Joshua, uh, what? one of the two, Caleb and Joshua, of the 12 tribes who went into the promised land and came back with a correct result. Um, but um, the 10 spies didn't want to go in and gave a bad report. And so um, Israel carried on walking around the wilderness for 40 years. And only Caleb and Joshua of that generation were allowed into the promised land. Um, and so Joshua is about to go in. He's about to go lead the people into the promised land. And uh, look at Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. He and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a dis distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. And then verse seven. Now the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. In verse 11, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is heading, is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. In verse 13, it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan will be cut off 
and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. And then verse 15 to 17. And when those who had carried the ark came into the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathan. And those which were flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Um, the crossing, of course, is a literal historical event, um, but it's one that has had repeated fulfillments uh, spiritually. And... Um, I spoke last time of the believer entering the promised land spiritually. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In a way, he is our promised land because we have entered into Christ. And we are called to lay hold of Nehemiah in uh, chapter 9, verse 15, said, enter in order to possess the land. So we have been called not just to come into our salvation, but to, to lay hold of everything that that salvation has brought us spiritually. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2. So we have been called into the promised land and we have been told to possess the blessings of that land, the spiritual blessings of that land. But of course, it has an ultimate fulfillment, this crossing into the promised land, as we, God's people, fully and finally make it to the heavenly Jerusalem. As we fully and finally get in, we find that we, uh, it, it will be, it, this account will have its final fulfillment. So um, here in Joshua, we're given the picture of that. Um, when Israel uh, finally crossed into the Promised Land, about 40 years after they had been wandering, uh, come out of Egypt, they'd uh, wandered in, in the wilderness for about 40 years. 40 years is often a picture of um, trial and uh, testing, as it were, and we know that they were tested in the wilderness. Um, and, and tried for, uh, for a, a long time. But after 40 years, they uh, came into the Promised Land through the Jordan. And the, the way that they went in was very specifically uh, told to them. Joshua said, um, first, the Ark would be carried in to the Promised Land by the priests. The Ark would be carried down into the waters of the Jordan. And when the Ark when the priest's feet touched that water, what happened was the waters on one side stood up in a great heap as far back as a city called Adam near Zarathan. And this is the only place in scripture where the city Adam is named. And um, it's about 16 miles, they think, from where the people crossed the Jordan opposite Jericho to go into the promised land. So the people followed the ark across, but they had to follow it 2,000 cubits, about 2,000 cubits behind. And though the priests carrying the ark would stand in the waters, Joshua 3 says that, the people would walk through on dry ground. So Joshua says, you haven't passed this way before. You haven't passed this way before. It's a new way. And so what is the picture that we can take then from this, um, from this example. The waters of the Jordan, as the waters of the Red Sea speak of death, the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, passed through death into life. And the waters of the Jordan is the same picture. You, John chapter five, verse 24, Jesus would say, when you come into salvation, you have passed through death into life. You have passed out of judgment into life. The ark is the presence of God isn't it? The ark signified the presence of God and it represents Christ Jesus. As the ark went down into the waters of death, the impact went all the way where? What does it say in the scripture in Joshua? 
the impact of the arc in the water sent the waters on one side back as far as Adam. What was the picture we might take from that? That the presence of Jesus, Jesus' death, has dealt with our sin back as far as Adam. The power of the ark in the water, the power of Christ over death and sin, has caused all the sin to be pushed back, to be taken back as far as Adam. Christ is the first one in the promised land, isn't he? He, he conquered death for us. He entered into the promised land and we enter in him spiritually now when we believe, but there will be a day when we finally and fully enter the promised land physically to be with him. How far away did the people follow? They followed about 2,000 cubits. Now, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff out there on the internet about the rapture being anytime soon. And it may be we have to live as if the rapture is going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if it will happen today or tomorrow or when. I don't know. But I do know that all the signs of the second coming of Jesus to this planet are there. We can watch them with our own eyes. We can read the newspaper. We can see online what's happening. So I think, I think that the rapture will be any day now. I think it will be soon. And I'm encouraged to think that as I read this account in Joshua, because the people had to stay about 2,000 cubits behind the ark. Why? Is that something about the fact that 2,000 years, about 2,000 years after Christ died and was resurrected, after he parted the water, after he conquered sin, that about 2,000 years after, we are going to walk through on dry land. There is a generation that won't see physical death, that they're going to walk through because of Christ's death, which pushed the, the, the uh, waters of sin and death back as far as Adam. I don't know. But in thinking about the race that we're running and the fact that we're eagerly desiring, desiring Christ, it's important, I think, that we look at some of these things and we think, OK, Lord, are you showing me that the rapture is going to be any day now? And if you are, what are you telling me? Joshua said, you have not passed this way before. You haven't passed this way before. We haven't passed that way before. We are headed for a real promised land. We are headed for a new heaven and a new earth. We are headed for something we haven't seen. We haven't experienced. We have been allowed to be with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have experienced every spiritual blessing or it's there for us to receive and lay hold of. But we haven't physically passed that way. That is a fulfillment that is still to come. First Thessalonians talks about it. John 14 talks about it. I talked about it in the last course. What God had done to enable us to be raptured, caught up together with Christ. All of those things, whatever view we take of it, we know that there is going to be a day when we do, as the, the Israelites did, crossed into Jordan on dry land. There is a day coming when we will cross into the physical promised land, the new heaven and the new earth, and we will be with Jesus. And, and Joshua had specific instructions. The Lord will do wonders among you. You have not passed this way before. Now, consecrate yourself. Look at what he says in Joshua 3. Um, do not come near that you, that you, verse 4, do not come near that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate yourself, set yourself apart for him. Be people of the Lord for tomorrow. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. And it is that that we are to keep in our mind 
that is the that is the way that we walk we remember that god has a finish line for us and the finish line is us going to be with him and when we consider the race and we think about how we're going to run it we are to understand that the life on this planet is a marathon and it is difficult and hard to run a marathon and you don't all set out really fast in the beginning because you'll come to a halt at the end you press on you keep the faith you guard your heart you look after the things that god has given you to look after and you 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 keep your eyes focused on Jesus you watch the ark as it goes through the Jordan you stay back so you can watch it you 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 hang back 2,000 cubits they were told you haven't passed this way before you better see what's going to happen and now we each of us we are watching Jesus we are seeing him we are keeping our eyes fixed on him the author and finisher of our faith the one who finished the race who finished the course who fought the good fight the one who got through the one that we follow we are keeping our eyes on him and the way that we help each other in this marathon is described for us as i said right at the beginning first corinthians chapter 12 verse 4 to 7 you have been given a gift more than one perhaps you have been given gifts by the Spirit. You have been given a ministry by the Lord Jesus. And the results of that ministry will be brought to you by God the Father. But it is all for the common good. Every believer who is running the race, every one of us are going to be the beneficiaries of the gifts that God has gifted each individual believer. Can you see it? We're all running the marathon together. In our generation, all of the believers, we are all running together. And your gift helps me to run my race. Your gifts help me. The ministry area that God has given you help me to run my race. When the mountain's too high for me and too hard and when I can't run it, you beside me remind me of the things of God. You tell me the truth about God. I hear your voice telling me about Jesus and I can lift my head and continue to run. Your gift is for the whole church. Your gift is for all of us, for the body of Christ to be built up. And as we choose to live on purpose, that means to understand that I have a gift that is for use for the common good, that God has given me a ministry, that he will bring the results, that he will live the life that I can't live, that he will do what I can't do. As I choose to do that, we will, as a body, do what God has left us here to do. You know, um, we're facing uh, a crisis at the moment. The world is facing a crisis, this coronavirus, but it's not the last one. There'll be many that come after this. This is just really the one that's opened our eyes to the fact that there is something that can stop our world, that can, can stop our normal behaviour. We're facing a crisis, but it's a tiny drop in the bucket of what is to come. We have to run, still run, the race set before us and the only way we'll do it is if we keep the faith if we remember that God says in Romans 8 that he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose that that we will choose to keep the faith that we will choose to keep our eyes on Jesus you know the church around the world has been facing tests and trials so much more than the, the, the West has ever done. They have been persecuted and had difficulty and mountains to climb that we have not faced. But the, um, that has been going on since the beginning of the church. Paul would write to Timothy and say, everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There is a persecution going on against the church and we in the West are starting to feel it. We've been protected 
partly because the countries we live in have been founded on Christian principles. The laws that, that exist in our countries have come from biblical Christian principles, but that is being rocked and shaken and taken away. And we are going to feel the effect of that. That is going to end up, it, well, it already is, in the persecution of Christians. The foundation of our nation, of nations around the world, is being eroded. There is a shaking going on. This war that we're in is being fought ferociously in our universities and schools, in churches. It's being waged against family and against uh, personhood even, against everything we have believed that we have built in the West. There is a ferocious attack going on, organized by Satan, uh, pushed by Satan, because as the day approaches that Jesus will come back, then the fight is going to heat up. And you and I in the West, although we have been protected for a long time, Satan is now turning his attention fully onto us. And he is eroding all of the Christian principles on which our society and our culture has actually been based. We have been protected for a while, but now the, um, the fight is heating up, the battle is getting stronger, and you and I, it is even more important that we understand that we are to live on purpose. We are to live for the purpose of the glory of God. We are to continue doing what he has called us to do. We are to keep the faith. faith. We are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. We are to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because if you look anywhere else, you will be tempted to stop running. You will not run the race. You will not finish the course. You will definitely not finish well. And we are to understand that we are to run this race together as a church, as a body of believers. We are to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ and his soon appearing. We are to discard every other thought, every other temptation, every other thing that tests us and tries us and calls us away from our focus on Jesus. And we are to run the race set before us and to know that the finish line is just ahead. The time of our departure is soon. And the thing is, if you can understand your departure in the way that Paul understood his departure, that it was a setting free, that he would go into a glorious eternity that would be so magnificent that it would not even bear the comparison to this life, no matter how good this life has been. If we can go that way, if we can keep our eyes fixed on that Jesus, we will overcome. We will help one another to overcome. We will run the race set before us and we will proclaim the glory of God, the purpose for which we have been left here. I said in the homework to look at Philippians chapter uh, at the end of chapter one and chapter two and we haven't got to it. I'm so sorry and the time's running out and I do want to finish. Um, I would ask you to look at the scriptures that uh, we've looked at today. Look at Joshua, look at um, 1 Corinthians, look at the other scriptures that I mentioned at the beginning. Go back over next week, over the Philippians, uh, the letter to the Philippians in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Read those verses. Read how Paul encourages people to run the race set before him, to view their life to live on purpose for the glory of God and and then come back next time and if you can't come back watch the video of next time so that we can discuss the practical ways that we can finish well I need you to walk and run with me I need you to fight with me I need you to stand with me I need you to lift me up when I am just about to give up. I need you to speak truth to me when I can hear voices that are calling me off this path. I need you to be the body of Christ for me and me for you so that we can live a life of purpose, 
a life lived for the glory of God, so that we can guard our hearts, so that we can set our eyes on Jesus, so that we can press on, so that we can eagerly desire his return. I need you and you need me. Let us do that together. Do all things for the glory of God. Finish the course, run the race, fight the good fight. Father, I um, thank you for your word. I thank you that it is amazing. I thank you that you have brought us um, to the truth. And I know that you will help us to do the things that you have called us to do. And so I ask, Lord God, that you would just continue to remind me of these things, that I might do my part in working out my salvation for your glory. And I thank you so much, Lord, for the great honour of doing that. In Jesus' name. Amen.